So when I first got in, it was 1986. I was from a, a, uh, a troubled home, but I was college bound. And I was the first person to graduate from, from a high school and go on to college. And I got all scholarships to get in. So I was, con- you know, I was a success story. Um, mm-hmm. And being with this group, it made me feel like they had adopted me. I had become their child and I had taken on this amazing purpose where we were going to save the world for God together. I didn't have that kind of family. So it's like every moment of the day, I had someone to talk to. I had someone to physically be with and have tons of of fun. You know, I was having so much fun. People would pick me up. People would take me to nice events where we were having clean fun. Uh, And so it seemed very innocuous and innocent. And then once they asked me to become into leadership, that's kind of how they lure you deeper into the um, culture, but they don't do this for, they don't do this for everybody because they have that, those baseline people who they consider just kind of minions. They're going to pay their tithes. They're going to show up. They're going to be happy, but they're not what they said, what they called quote unquote sharp. So the people that Mm -hmm. us to recruit were people who were wealthy, people who were, um, if they were single business people um, or people who were in the entertainment industry. And so I said in my email at one point, uh, I was in New York, I got to the New York city church and in the New York city church, they had a whole, team of people that specifically focused on people in the entertainment industry. And so um, the guy from Bill Cosby, uh, Alvin, he was, he's still there in the New York, I think he's in Connecticut or New Jersey, but he was in, he was there. I would see him at service. Andy McDowell, she was a famous actress, more in the, like the nineties. She came in for a while and then she quickly um, exited. But that was, those were the kind of people that they wanted us to recruit. And so if I brought in someone who was not of that caliber, then I was chastised. Why are you bringing someone who is not sharp? You need to be getting people who are smart and who are rich and who are you know, these kinds of people. So you would be critiqued on the kind of people that you brought in based on who they thought you were. And I was a beauty pageant contestant and all this kind of things. And so I could not bring anybody in beneath me or I would be chastised. And then they were constantly changing your, shifting your, your alliances and your relationships. And, and now I realize, ah, that kept me very unstable. If I was getting too close to someone um, or they felt like maybe they were losing control of me, then I might get a call in the middle of the night. We had something called discipling partners where you would have someone who was spiritually like kind of your senior. And so... Um, if I was, if they thought I was doing really well in my outreach and, 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 and smiling and happy, then they might call me up in the middle of the night and say, okay, your disciples switch now. Now you're going to be discipled by the evangelist's wife. And it's like, I don't know her. And immediately I was supposed to leave the other person behind and now come and meet with this person. And the goal was to become, not to become like Jesus or to become like God. It was to become as much like this person as possible. And in doing that, that's how you were being obedient to Jesus because you were following your disciple to the point of being exactly like them. I remember one day I was on campus, I was in college, and some of my friends from the group were like, Stacy, Stacy, so and so, the pastor's wife is looking for you. And I'm thinking, she's a grown woman with married, she was with children. What is she doing on the college campus roaming around looking for me? So finally I got in touch with her and she goes, you need to be in Cleveland tonight. Um, they're going to be meet so-and-so and they're going to pick you up. Granted, I had classes. I still needed to attend. I had to go to work. I skipped my classes, didn't go to work. And I drove six hours to Chicago to meet with people I'd never met before um, to convince me to go on um, a mission trip to Cleveland. I was one of their top recruiters at a time, at, at, at a time. And I mean, I went over and spent two years in Africa to recruit people into the group. So um, I wasn't just even your everyday member. I rose up through the ranks in the organization. But after I'd already spent two years in Africa and almost died with them, I was penniless. I almost died. I contracted multiple 
infections and diseases. Um, no one took care of me. I ended up in um, some very precarious places with these people. And I think when I came back from, when I was in Africa, that's when I realized, wait a minute, there's something not right here. They are leaving, they're bringing me to another country and then always like picking on me. Um, and that's when I was like, yeah, something's not right. And I think I had a little twins of, if this wasn't the right doctrine, which I wholeheartedly believe, I would leave them, but nobody else has the truth. And at that point I was about 21, about 21. Mm -hmm. And my another revelation to about 26 when I was married. I ended up marrying somebody from, uh, from the group. So all of our um, dating and marriage was arranged inside of the group. Um, you could be put out um, and shunned for dating or marrying someone outside of the group. And even people who were inside of the group had to be approved for you. You're monitored in that relationship to, to the point where they neutralize you, where you're supposed to just think of this person as your friend, as, as, as a brother and sister. So they sexually kind of like neutralize you and then expect you all of a sudden when you get married to, you know, just be this, you know, this, this, you know, very intimate when you've never probably, if you followed their guidelines, like I did, had never been alone with the person you're married to, you get married to for un unsupervised, maybe for more than an hour, if that. Mm -hmm. Once you get married, they want to constantly know all the intimate details and workings of your relationship, physically, emotionally, everything. And that's when I was like, wait a minute, this is, I thought getting married, to me, getting married was an escape. I thought I would get a little bit of freedom. And then mm -hmm. I realized, wait a minute, now they're going into areas of, of, of my life that I can't even keep private, my marital relationship. And then when I had children, I had my first child in 2001, one of the group members gave me a book called Baby Wise. Using this book, I almost starved my daughter to death. Had intestinal and um, eating challenges all of her life. And I really think it stems back to, I took this book and I took them very seriously. I would let her cry for hours and I would try to feed her on this schedule. And if you look up that book, there are people in the evangelical Christian movement who've used that and children have actually died from following that. I finally threw it out and was like, you know what? This is stupid. I don't like this. I really used to think that it was about saving people. Um, but the leader, the, the guy who kind of like mastermind this, Kip McKean, is an, is an egomaniac. And I think he's probably even a bit delusional because he, I've heard that he has said to people that he thought he was a, a modern day apostle and they had to talk him out of it. Like, yeah, right. You see, you never know who's going to become. You may have that pit in your stomach. But daggone it, you got to preach the word, amen? You got to spit up and get up. I think it was some, some ideas that maybe started off very with very pure intentions. But as he became more narcissistic and, and had people following him and listening to him and being very savvy of getting a group of people around him who would follow his dictates around the world and getting very wealthy. I mean, very wealthy. The top people, like in Chicago, they were living in Winnetka and million dollar houses. Kip mm -hmm. McKee had a million dollar condo. His kids went to Harvard and, and, uh, and they don't speak to him and they don't go to the church anymore. But they have Harvard educations off of our dime. So I think that he was, he was very charismatic and no one could ever check him. And when, once he finally did, there's people whose very lives now, I, I know a couple who lives here in Chicago, they're what, in their 60s? They've worked for the church for 20 years, $100,000 a year. Are you going to give that up and you have no college education and you have no other work background or you haven't worked in 20 years? Are you going to leave this? No. 
but they knew the scriptures that, you know, there's, there's people who are, are, are Christians and I knew nominal Christians, but I didn't know people who knew the Bible like this group did and who had memorized it, who could mm. do scriptures, who could tell you, who had learned enough about history to tell you the detailed things now that I know are that they are true about the Nicene Creed, about Constantinople, about how you got the first original Bible. I mean, they knew things that were were historical and mm -hmm. that no other group could touch. I could out talk a, a nominal Catholic, a nominal Baptist on any day. I knew my scripture. I, I could I could make your head spin and you would be like, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not a Christian. I could convince you that your dead grandmother wasn't a Christian. Thus, they would have classes after classes where we would memorize this stuff. You know, you well, what if someone says this, what do you say and what do you do? So they trained us very well how to do that. Um, and then they also would have this point that once you got someone so far in their studies with you, you gave them a kind of an ultimatum, I guess, to test to see how committed they were. And you would kind of point your, your, your hand and make the gun sign and say, you know, if someone pointed your head, a gun to your head, would you deny Christ? And by this time, you got the person so indoctrinated and they're like, no, they just have to kill me. And then you were like, OK, yeah, this person's ready. You call the evangelist. Yeah, this person's ready to be baptized. They're they're committed. They're going to go all the way with this. But that frightens me now. I think another time that freaked me out was a um, they put someone underneath me in my little chain because it was almost like a multi-level marketing. And I was, you know, you, you had person up here and then you had, you know, people going down. Um, she was mentally unstable and she called me and she goes, I feel like killing myself and I need Prozac and all this kind of stuff. And I'm 20, I'm 19, 20, maybe 21 years old. And I'm like, dude, I'm not prepared for this. And they would have us meet with people every week, almost like these therapy sessions. Finally, I went and talked to like the person over me and said, you know what, this person is saying such and such to me and, and I don't know what to say with, to her. And so she, the, the evangelist wife says, well, tell her, if, if, is she serious? Tell her to go ahead and do it. If not, stop talking about it if you're not going to do anything about it. Now, granted, I didn't go back and say this to her because I was like, that is not what you say to someone. That's, I'm not going to say that. Now, I didn't tell her I wasn't going to say that, but that was red flag to me. I was like, yeah, I don't know why this is not kosher, but this is not kosher. <laughs>